Step 2. Private versus public keys. So one way to establish a private key between Alice and Bob is to use a public channel. And keys that are established in such a way are known as public keys. So here is how it works. We've got two parties that are trying to communicate, Alice and Bob. And they can communicate over a public channel. Public means that anybody has access to this channel. So any message that they transmit, that they used to communicate with, can be heard and intercepted by any other party. So this channel is not secure, in the sense that anybody can read any message that they send. So what Alice does is she generates two keys. One is known as the public key, and the other one is known as the private key. What she then does is she uh, sends the public key to Bob that she generated. He uses that to encrypt his message. And then what he does is he can just send it back to Alice. Then she uses the private key that she did not communicate to Bob to decrypt Bob's message and read what it is. So in public key cryptography, public key is used to encrypt the message, but it cannot be used to decrypt the message. The de message is decrypted by the private key that Alice generated but did not share with over the public channel. And it works, but it has some disadvantages. It is slow, it is expensive, and more importantly, it is what's known as computationally secure. Meaning that anybody listening to the channel is able in principle to break the encryption. If either they have uh, large amount of computational resources or computational time. So it is not unconditionally secure. A different way of uh, establishing, and this is the crucial point, is that quantum computers uh, can in principle break computationally secure protocols like this with relative ease. So, how can, we, how can we actually establish secure connection between Alice and Bob? The other alternative method is to use a private key. Here, what happens is that there is some generator, some hypothetical device that can generate private key. And that key is then sent to Alice and sent to Bob. Now, Alice and Bob are sharing some correlated secret key that only they know. And they can use it to encrypt their message. For example, Bob encrypts his message, he sends it to Alice, where Alice uses her part of the secret key uh, to uh, decrypt it and read the message. This is known as a one-time path or the Vernum cipher. And it is secure, it cannot be broken, provided that it is used only once. So, if Bob has a message of n bits that he's trying to send to Alice, he requires a private key that's at least n bits long. And once he uses that private key to encrypt his message, he cannot use it again. If he has some other thing to say to Alice, they require a completely new and fresh private key to ensure security. So, as we said, it's not very efficient in the sense that it requires large amount of key bits. The number of keys has to be at least as high, as big as the message itself. So, that's actually pretty good, but there is one remaining question. And that's, uh, how do we actually distribute this key? In this scenario, we just assume that the private key generator can distribute this private key to Alice and Bob. But of course, there is a question of what channel should the private key generator use? Because uh, public channels are monitored by whoever uh, is listening. And this is where uh, quantum mechanics comes into play, as we will see in the next step.